My greatest hope for the Welsh nation is... A few days ago, I saw a pro-Welsh independence group called Yes Cymru put out a quote on its social media which I found most peculiar by a woman named Bethany Davies who says that she is an historian. I don't know if she is or not. I've not gone into her much. I don't see much evidence she is, but I don't want to disclaim that she's not. But she had a quote which I found very indicative of something I have seen within Welsh nationalism which has caused me much pain in my mind in so far as why do these people think this way? Why do people think that we are this forever oppressed group? And this is what she said. The Welsh have always fought for their liberties and freedoms. History tells us so. The conquest of Wales in 1282 by Edward I began a tradition of revolution and uprising in Wales. In 700 years, nothing has changed. It is the same struggle, the same fight, the same grievances and inequalities. The root of all troubles remains, and they will always remain until Wales gains independence. Okay, I'm going to take apart this quote and just... The Welsh have always fought for their liberties and freedoms. Have they? I mean, we've done a lot, but we've had one war of independence since conquest. Just one. Most nations like Poland, Ireland, I mean, etc. The Basques, I mean, they've had several wars. We've had one in... 730 years. It's not 700. She says he's, she says she's an historian. You should get it right. 730. No. 740 years. That's closing in on 750 years ago. Now that's a mark. You need to get it closer to 750. Okay, I'll give it to you. 700 years ago. Let's, let's just move on. History tells us so. I don't think that's accurate. The conquest of Wales in 1282. No, the conquest began in 1282. It, it was complete by 1284. The war was lost in 1283. Minor point. I mean, I'm not going to mark her hard for that, but if you're an historian, you need to get that more pinpointed. Next. Began a tradition of revolution. No, as I'm going to show you in this video, we don't have a tradition of revolution in Wales. We just don't. That relates to my greatest hope for Wales, which I'm getting to, and that we see this basic truth about who we are. In 700 years, nothing has changed. Are you kidding? We have gone from medieval times through being the cradle of the Industrial Revolution that gave the world the railway, basically, into post-industrial decay and poverty. After great poet mansions. I mean, a lot's changed, all right? That's just my way of saying. It is the same struggle, the same fight, the same grievances. No, it's not the same struggle. The war of 1282-83, I'll get to it in a bit, but that was the ruler of a kingdom fighting the ruler of another kingdom. People in England at that time in history were much freer than people in Wales. The same grievances and inequalities. No, that's Marxism. No, that's communism. No, it's not the same grievances as 730 years ago. That's absurd. That's trying to rewrite history to construct a dialectic neo-Marxist narrative and plant it on top of our whatever your struggle is today and say that's what Llewellyn the Great and Llewellyn the Last were fighting for. That wasn't. 
just to clarify that. The root of all trouble remains, and they will always remain until Wales gains independence. I would say it's either way around. You have to address the root of your psychological victimhood first before you can actually become a, an independent state. Right, so I need to be clear about what we're dealing with here. So just from those words, and we can break them apart, we know that we're dealing with a Marxist-related belief. That is the roots of communism, but it's not just communism, it's rooted in Gnosticism, an early Christian sect which believed it had hidden knowledge. This is where Marxism came from. But for this conversation, we need to understand that this is a dialectic kind of thought. By dialectic, I mean two opposing forces that are in a centrifuge cycle, which are going to come together, explode, and produce utopia by unleashing God through social justice, essentially. You've heard the phrase perhaps dialectically opposed to each other? So this thought process creates a system in which you are cast into one of two types. The marginalized, oppressed, ever saintly, pure, minority, enslaved group, or the evil, demonic oppressor, right? They believe in these two groups, oppressor and oppressed. Now, who is in these groups changes over time. It's changed since Karl Marx's age, according to what these people who believe in these things need to gain power. But you have basically whoever's the marginalized, oppressed, saintly group, the enslaved, whatever. And then you have the oppressors, which today have become basically white males or anyone who's remotely traditional in any sense. And these are di dialectically opposed to each other. And that's why I'm calling these dialectical believers. These people believe in this dialectical system, which is going to spin through history, they believe, and unlock some kind of social justice utopia, which is their god. This is a religion. Marxism, fused into neo-Marxism with liberalism, is a religion. And we need to be aware of that going forward. This quote made me think back to 2020 when a lot had gone wrong in my life. I was a bit broken and broke. I turned to a friend, Guillem Bowen Harris, and I went back up to Gwyneth, where I went to university. Now, I had begun to connect the dots, but let's step back. I had become disenchanted with liberalism, which I had studied in my spare time. Now, I still have a lot of liberal values which I hold dear, especially people like David Lloyd George, Joe Grimmond. But the modern liberal tradition strayed so far away from it, I felt that I didn't belong in that rut. Or rather, I was in a rut because I didn't belong in that groove. And I went back up to Gwyneth with Guillem Bon Ruiz for a bit of help. And I noticed right away that some of the unease which I had felt at university or around groups like Gwyneth the City Gaif, or around other such pro Wales, pro Welsh language groups, I began to slowly connect the dots that this was rooted in some kind of dialectical oppressor oppressed Marxist view of looking at the world and I didn't understand where exactly this came from and as I was disenchanted with liberalism and unsure of what I was to do who I was what I was going through I did turn to thinking well what about um, the conservative party you know I was curious I'm from another country I want to explore different things before I settle down and decide what I'm doing and who I am. And it became clear to my friend that I was exploring this and his reaction was quite, there was an underlying bitterness, an underlying resentment there that I, 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 I still don't understand. He, he showed me this image. He had little mats which said Nidois Tori in a Tihun, which is like a reference to a literary work in which in that little box was Tory, so the Conservative Party, insinuating that because you're exploring a different political belief and exploring who you are, that you're somehow a traitor to 
some group that I don't understand that. We live in a democracy. Nobody's killing each other. And I just began to notice like, yeah, there are communist symbols around these Welsh nationalists, hammers and sickles, Marxist flags. And I just was like, what is going on? Where did this come from? This is not indigenous to Welsh culture. It's, it's not. I've studied Welsh culture. Marxism did not, I mean, Marxism came from further east. So where did this idea come from? This was just before I began this YouTube channel. I was searching for direction and I began to look at my country, Wales, and think, what are my hopes for it? What do I want for it? And part of this channel was what I wanted to give back to Wales. And so, my greatest hope for the Welsh nation is and living with my friend and being around so many Welsh nationalists prior and even since, I can see that these people genuinely believe, they think that we have a tradition of revolution in Wales and we don't. We genuinely don't. We have uprisings here and there, but it's not a tradition. We are the most loyal sycophants to the imperial order in the history of the planet Earth. We are beyond loyal, historically. We are the exemption to any kind of rebellion. That's what Wales is. And there's no, there's no shame in that. And I think these people feel shame that we have been so loyal, but that's who we are as a nation. It is what has kept our language alive. So I want to go through a few of these historical points briefly, which these dialectical believers, these people who believe in the dialectic between oppressor and oppressed, that it defines our nation somehow, that each of these points which they exemplify, this is a complete lie. This is not a tradition of revolution that we're looking at. It's something else entirely, which makes Wales extremely unique and beautiful. So let's go through that now. The first of these periods which these dialectical believers often rewrite or put into a context which is not entirely accurate is the War of Conquest upon Wales, 1282-1283, with then the legal system morphing into place in 1284. And yes, they're right, this was an unjust war. The Principality of Gwynedd, which was a kingdom, but called a principality, at war with an enemy 30 times its size, it was never going to go well, and it was a very brotherly war. Llewellyn the last stood up for his brother and was willing to fight to the death for him. And yes, it was just, it was a cause for justice, absolutely, but it did not fit into any such tradition. What makes this war so remarkable is two things, actually. We almost won, that's one, we narrowly lost this war. We were on the verge of winning the war of 18, 12, 82, 83. We almost won. And secondly, the reason we almost won is because our unity was in such contrast to the 1277 war in which lords and princes were not fighting on the same side through the whole thing. And speaking of that at aristocracy, Llewellyn ap Griffith had an army around him of lords and men of high rank and prestigious positions, and they were fighting for their birthrights and their landed estates. This was not a fight for the common people, the commoners who were basically a serf class of slaves tied to the land. At this point, at least in the late 13th century, Englishmen were much freer than the common Welsh man. And that's something that dialectical believers do not like to talk about or admit. The next period of history, believers in this dialectic oppressor class thing like to use 
to show their belief in a tradition of revolution is Owen Glendur. This man revolted in 1399, and after him, continuing this revolt, lasted into the 1420s in parts. But it was petered out mostly by 1412. However, they like to say that this was a revolution of the people fighting injustice. Well, it did have a tink of that, but this was a new Wales struggling to come into being. It was not based off of anything, truly, that had come before it, though it used things that came before it. It was an aristocratic attempt to create a feudal humanism, as you saw was happening in northern Italy and Sweden, and Romania, actually. But they added on to it this Oxbridge, Oxford and Cambridge idea. This was not fighting for grievances of equality. This was fighting for inheritance, again, of birthright. There was no suggestion of dialectic struggle against the oppressor. Sorry. 1588. This is when Welsh, the language, when we got our Bible in the language, which was immense. This is often used by dialectic types to say that we were using the Bible to resist assimilation and to fight this oppressor class. No, what we did is we went to Her Majesty the Queen and basically said, if you give us this Bible, we will be infinitely loyal and at your service forever. Please buy our loyalty and we will be obedient for the empire. And that's exactly what happened. There wasn't a squeak from us. There were a few Catholics, crypto-Catholics for a while, but they were gone before too long. This was a sales receipt for our loyalty to the English establishment. That's what our Welsh Bible was. Today's political activists in Wales like to hark back in Romanticism to Martha Tidville in the early 1830s to say, this is proof of our revolutionary tradition. But yes, the people there were certainly fighting injustice and they had every reason to rise up in anger and I mean, it was a horrific time. But about 1793 to 1828 especially, this was a moment of apocalyptic change in Wales. We were the first industrial nation on earth. And I don't care who you are, wherever you are, if that happened, you're going to have a rupture. Some call it the crucible that we cross through. And then Merthyr Tidville kind of like the hurrah at the end, in the 1830s. And there were a lot of little uprisings and riots and stuff across Wales. But I want to explain to you in brief, after you see how many there were, this is actually proof that this was a fluke, not the norm. Look at all these here. Contrary to popular belief, this is not proof of any revolutionary tradition. It stands out so brilliantly because it's not like any other part of Welsh history. It's actually the only time which we were that rebellious. The only time that all these different parts of Wales were rising up in revolt. The only time that we had some sense of creeping radicalization. And it's, a, and it's the only time in which the English language truly began to infiltrate 
the working man and change that culture. Socialism coming in for the first time after this was a foreign imposition, an ideology from a foreign power. It was not Welsh, this dialectic Marxist thought after this. Now I'll admit it is a part, a part of Wales now, but it's not the Welsh nation. It's not the expression of our identity. It is not the driver of our spirit. It is a part of our history due to being subjugated. If you want independence, then it would take liberation from these ideas because these dialectic thoughts are the thoughts of an enslaved mind. In the 20th century, the status quo in Wales has been the Labour Party. A hundred and two years, a hundred and two years. We've not really ever had a revolt against them. If you've never thrown out the majority vote in 102 years, you are not a revolutionary nation. You don't have a tradition of revolution. Because true revolution is not rebellion against someone else. It's rebellion against your own ideas. Yes, we've had the minor strikes. We've had riots earlier in the 1900s. But when offered with devolution the first time, we voted against the existence of our own nation. Even when we got it and backed it ourselves, it was merely a vote by, I mean, what was the majority? Like 6,000 people or something? That's nothing. No, the 20th century, and I'm not going to go into it very much, is testimony to how loyal and obedient we have been as a nation. I mean, this almost became our flag, and there's nothing wrong with that. In the 20th century, Plaid Cymru began with the suggestion of a revolutionary change, breaking away from this non-conformist, socialist-leaning ideology. But as time went by, it just became a mirror inverse reflection of labor. Socialist, but not British. Labor is socialist, but British. That's really the main difference between them. And if you can never offer anything that's not socialist or dialectic in thought, if you can never have a revolution against the dialectical belief, then you're not a revolutionary nation and you don't have a revolutionary tradition. My hope for Wales is not some right-wing government ad infinitum that lasts forever. That would be just what we have now in reverse. The same immaturity the same lack of development of ideas, the same inability to revolt against ourselves, the same inability to have an honest discussion without seeing somebody else as an adversary merely for not going along with the group and the group think and some type of collective mentality that has no basis in reality. My greatest hope for the Welsh nation is maturity, political maturity, social maturity, economic maturity, and that means not always thinking in your mind how to revolt and have a revolution against someone else, but rather having the ability within your own culture to have a revolution against your own culture, your own values. Every true nation has a revolution against itself, eventually. That is the mark of a mature nation. You're not in this dialectic of oppressor versus oppressed. We're not living in some Victorian fantasy of the flat caps, yes sir, to the top hats, and the revolution of the workers. It's not fresher year at university when you go join all the political causes to prove that you're a good, virtuous person. That's not how nations work. 
to not be forever etched in the mould of the chained victim, then if you can't break those chains psychologically, you're not in a position mature-wise or socially to be an independent nation. And after we get to that point, because it's not that you achieve independence and then you become mature enough for a state. No, you become mature enough for a state first, getting rid of this forever obsessed with the oppressed dynamic, and then you become a state. It doesn't work the other way around, and I think many, the majority of Welsh nationalists seem to think that the way to liberation is a state, when actually a state is the effect of a liberated mind. My intention in this video was not to insult Bethany, or Yes Cymru, or the tradition of Welsh socialism, which is, after 130 years or so, a part of Wales now. One that I happen to disagree with, but that doesn't make it invalid as some type of Welsh. But my hope is to get more people to understand that we can't just rewrite our history to fit some political narrative when it's not true. The loyalism of our nation, the monarchy loving of our nation, the fealty, the proud British nature of who we are, that is not at odds with being an independent state. Look at Canada. Why couldn't Wales have voices like that if clearly our history shows that we are more like that. And I think Welsh groups like Yes Cymru, which albeit I will say that Yes Cymru tries to offer a platform that's wider, casting a wider net to include other views that are not just socialist, albeit they fly a red flag, which is the dialectic believers keep trying, and I don't get why they keep trying to impose an image of Wales upon us that doesn't exist. And I hope this is not the end of Wales, that this obsession with being morally virtuous and good does not go so far in that you're driving your nation, our nation, into the ground, into oblivion for the sake of being a good person unable to accept that you're wrong. That the reason Plague Cymru doesn't win because of its inability to try something new, to have a revolution against ourselves. That's my greatest hope. We need the courage to just revolt against ourselves once in a while and have new ideas that are not connected to Marxist dialectic thought. If you'd like to buy me a coffee or support me on Patreon, please do. Thank you very much for watching. My rant is over.